Hello everyone, welcome to Photographer's Hello. Night, the voice of cameramen and camera women. The bitch of Vanity Fair was so proud, she made it very easy to get us all kidnapped. This is what your home said. I had a lover in Cuba. We should all have a lover in Cuba. That's what Desiree Doron said. With no more information than the name of the town of Zarco, I boarded the taxi of Hassan, who spoke no English, and off we went. That's Catherine Cooper. Fondation Cartier. Should I do that? That is Martin Usbar. <laughs> Tonight I'll speak with uh, Jeroen Kamer, Catherine Cooper, Martin Usbar, and Desiree Doron to hear what they experienced in the field when they were making their work. I am curious to see how their personal encounters might have affected <coughs> their work. What we see here of your work is where hunting dogs rest. Can you tell a bit about it and then more about what you experienced making it? And I went to Spain to help in the rescue centers and discovered this really uh, incredible story of um, very, very beautiful, very royal dogs that had been used for since the 4th century for hunting and had been associated with queens and kings and, and had now become something that you could throw away. <clears throat> and I wanted to capture something about the story from, from beauty to, to pain. And I, so I worked in, in rescue centres and I found that I had to pick up the camera again because I was actually trying to write a book about helping animals and I decided that really the camera was one of my best ways of explaining my feelings and my story. So I spent two months in a rescue centre helping dogs, walking dogs, looking after dogs um, and occasionally photographing dogs. And I began to photograph these dogs, um, and they're all photographed in rescue centres, um, and they're all photographed um, in small little houses where they sleep at night. And the rescue centres have no money, so it's very, very basic conditions. But I was trying to use the light that was there in a way that reminded us of the classical heritage of the dogs and in particular the painting of Velasquez, which was very sort of from a single point source of light and had a sort of feeling of heavy beauty. Um, but at the same time I wanted to show the dogs not feeling so confident because they did not have a confident story. Can I, can I ask, when did you realise you wanted to photograph the dogs like this? After about probably about two or three weeks of trying different things and trying them outside, trying them, you know, looking more m moving still, then I realised I wanted to tell that story. <clears throat> and then I was also travelling around the area of South Spain and photographing the landscape, which was very, very beautiful, and realising that these dogs were so connected with the landscape. These dogs are, are used, they, they hunt in the landscape, they, they, they chase rabbits across the uh, fields, but they also are abandoned in the landscape, and sometimes they die in the landscape. So I was trying to photograph places that these dogs belonged, but also places that I found stray dogs as well. So this is on the edge of a town where many dogs were living, for example. Were you afraid? Um entering a shelter like that, with so many dogs, about 40, 50 dogs? No, I, 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 I love dogs, and the dogs are very scared of humans. Uh, and I spent, sort of, and the whole project took me two years, in the end, two and a half years. And it was all fine until the last day, and I took my last photograph of, of, of a dog, and then that dog got into a fight, because there was too many dogs in the centre um, and the dog died in front of me and when he died in front of me I just kind of lost it and it was because I spent two and a half years dealing with the story and I think it was only after I put the camera down that I was able to really process the emotional side of it yeah. This is, did you ever see a dog fight before? Or? No, no, I mean it was just a sudden like that and he was bitten and the 
his stomach, so he died. Yeah. And that was, uh, for you, that was um, the moment to stop? No, I'd already stopped. That was a strange thing. I stopped, and then he had a fight, and then he died. So it was just a weird sort of ending to the whole thing. Like, just a question about how did you get them to stand like that? Well, they didn't stand. These were very scared dogs. Um, I mean, they did stand, but they didn't stand very long. I mean, they're very scared, they're very nervous, and in a way, I'm much more interested in the moment when the dog is not looking quite right. Because it's so, it's so easy to get a picture when the dog is looking perfect. It, 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 when a dog is looking perfect, or when a photograph is looking perfect, then I think there's nothing for the viewer to, to see, right? You're, it's, it's finished. But when a dog is looking, or a person is looking, something is looking not quite right, then you can begin to think, what's happened? It's the same when you meet someone. If they're happy all the time and everything's perfect, there's no story, right? So this is, I wanted to capture the story. There's this, like this dog is very thin, and this dog is looking away from the camera. That, for me, is more interesting. You said something about that it is also part of yourself. Um, you look in the dog for a certain emotion or a sort of feeling you want to find. Uh, or you're, you're looking for something. And yeah, I mean, I, I remember um, someone being very critical of my work, saying that it's uh, anthropomorphic. You know, I'm projecting myself onto the dogs. And I'm like, I don't understand how you don't project yourself. I don't really understand how you take an objective picture. You know, if I take a portrait, it's always a portrait of me at the same time as a portrait of the person. It's, it, there's always two, it's always a conversation. So yes, this is very much about my own experiences of when I was a kid, I couldn't speak and I had anxiety and all those things. So it was... That's, when I was young is when I became kind of in connection with animals, I think, yeah. Can you imagine that people look at it and say, ah, awful, and they look away? Uh, something strange happened at Paris Photo when we showed this work, that people really um, were chatting away, and then they saw this work, and then they stopped, and they nearly cried and uh, they complimented us for bringing it. So it was like we were doing, you know, we were in some religious group, we were doing something good over there in this money-blown environment. Right, well, that's nice. That's nice. <laughs> I think it's more interesting to show things which are not just beautiful. And, and with animals as well, there's, and dogs. We're so used to seeing dogs looking funny or silly or cute and it's quite I think it's quite important to show them as beings that have suffering and difficulties and so on. Um, a bit lighter note, you also did a um, series Dogs and Cars and you were looking at London for cars and where dogs were locked up. How did you look for these dogs? When I started the project Dogs in, Car Dogs in Cars at night time, and uh, I started it by trying to find dogs in cars uh, in the street, and I couldn't find any, so I decided to go to a supermarket. Is this a story you were after? <laughs> so I went to the, store, to the supermarket, and they were looked for dogs in, in cars, and there were no dogs in cars. So I remember walking around the supermarket car park barking, and still no dogs and cars, but the security guard came out and found me and I decided I'd better find another way of doing these pictures that were looking for dogs and cars. So all the pictures in the end were, were set up. Um, your next project will be on animal farms. Animal, um, yeah. animal, animals on farms. Farm, just farm, farm animals. animals yeah. 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 Um, I want to just take a series of life-size Print, make life-size prints of of, um, of uh, pictures of farm animals. Um, when we see farm animals, we tend to see them in a way that's been very mediated. It's like 
either they're looking happy in a field on the back of a back of a, a box of milk or something, or they're looking um, you see inside a slaughterhouse or something. I just wanted to I want to show farm animals in a very immediate way. So the idea is to photograph them and print them at full size. So when you walk into the room, you literally meet the animal. There's no... So how are you going to go to a farmer and say, can I uh, photograph your pig? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Isn't that difficult? No. It's a lot easier than asking, asking someone if I can borrow their car <laughs> and asking someone else if I can borrow their dog and then saying, can you both meet me at the beach at four in the morning, which is what I did for one of the shots. And then it didn't work, so I was saying, can you come back tomorrow morning at four <laughs> with your car and your dog, but I won't pay you any money because I haven't got any money to pay. So asking to photograph someone's pig is quite easy. <laughs> you, will, you, will, um, uh, you will photograph happy pigs, or are you...? No, I'm not trying to photograph, I just want to... I'm kind of slightly inspired by the work of Richard Everton for this. I just want to photograph. No, no, just that kind of very brutally simple. What I love about his photographs is he doesn't rely that much on background or on lighting. I mean, it is great lighting, but it's not gimmicky lighting. And so if you take away the props and the lighting and the color, actually, I want to photograph with a large format black and white then I think you're left with something which is much more skeletal, much more raw, and I, 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 there will be no background, it will be, it'll be, a, it'll be a cow on a white background, printed life-size. So when you walk in the room, it's you and the cow. There's no grass, <laughs> there's no milk, there's no politics, there's just you and the cow. And then we will never again look the same way to this package. Of the thing is, it totally relies on it totally relies on capturing that split second where the cow somehow communicates. Mm. And you can't get a cow to do tricks. <clears throat> you can't get them to wear a stupid hat, but you can. But it's not about that. It's about capturing something. And I don't know if it'll work, but if if there's a way of making the viewer look at the cow so that they form some kind of connection, just something, and recognize that as a being, then that's, that's done, that's the work done. And I think if we can do that, then, then it's much more powerful than using uh, you know, beautiful lighting or using beautiful um, colors. It's just, it's just that, because it's, it, it's only connect. That is the most powerful thing. In the whole in the whole picture, so. but you know, it might it might not work, but hopefully. I like it. They only connect. Um, <clears throat> some people will say, "Why animals, not me?" By the way, but what about the starving children in Syria? You've had that question as well. Oh, uh, sorry. yeah. I mean, no, no it's just it, yeah, it's just. Um, I mean, what about both? I mean, you know, and it's. Um, it's, I mean, what I'm, what I'm interested in is why do we separate? Why do we separate out the two? And there's an assumption behind that question, which is if you, do, if you help animals, then you don't help people. And I think we should help beings. And I'm afraid that the assumption that we should help animal, uh, humans first, and I probably do, help humans first. I think if you analyse that, there is some danger that actually it's the kind of assumptions that can lead to other mistakes in thinking like racism and sexism and everything else. There's a, there's a danger, and it's a very controversial thing, but that you're basically being speciest. You know, you're saying put our, our lot first, put the other lot second, because they are different. And I think that is a form of disconnect, which is a very, very dangerous way of thinking. So, uh, absolutely, children, absolutely, uh, humans, absolutely, animals. And um, would I help my friend first? Yes. Would I help a human first? Probably. But I hope that I can extend my compassion beyond that as well.
Thank you for saying that. I so rarely hear said what I think, and thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you as well. Thank you very much, Martin.